Hi, I'm Oliver Gao. I'm the director of Cornell Systems Engineering Program. I will be conducting these system conversations with our great speakers that we bring to Corn Cornell uh, for Ezra System Seminar Series. So today we are very delighted to have Robert uh, Hampshire, uh, who is an associate professor of public policy at the Ford School, and also a research associate professor in both the UM Transportation Research Institute, known as AMTRI, uh, in, especially in, in its human factors group, as well as Michigan Institute for Data Science. I think these are both very hot areas of research. So Robert, his research focuses on the management and policy analysis of emerging innovative mobility services, such as smart parking, connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, Right, right hailing, bike sharing, and car sharing. So, as I said, you know, these are all very good topics now the whole society is concerned about, is interested in. So, uh, Robert, welcome uh, to Cornell. We have <laughs> always you. wanted to bring you here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Thanks uh, yes. So, uh, <clears throat> you have had a very fantastic career, you know, uh, from your study, from the PhD, all the way to the research that you are doing now. And I can see that your research is absolutely a very good reflection mm -hmm. of systems uh, approach, yeah. you know, from human factors yeah. to data and then to all the in-depth, you know, queuing theory. So um, I believe lots of us, we want to know more about yourself, yeah. Yeah. your research and oh. your career. So maybe we can start from here. Yeah, I can, thanks for, again, thanks for having me. Um, so actually, you may not realize my undergrad degree was in electrical engineering. So oh. I'm a you know electrical engineer by training, uh, by undergrad training. Mm -hmm. But there at that point, I was uh, got connected to Bell Laboratories. So I did a few, mm -hmm. some internships at, at Bell Labs. So I really, see. my background, you know, stems from systems analysis of communication systems. Communication system. Yeah. So uh, this, for my time at Bell Labs, really looking at telecom networks, um, really got me into congestion control, mm -hmm. uh, 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 queuing theory, that sorts of things. And that that's how I, you know, my actually my PhD dissertation is about communication networks and, uh, and, and congestion control. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from there, uh, my first position was, a, I was a professor at Carnegie Mellon. I see. Mm -hmm. And it actually turns out at that point, I made a, a, a switch into... I call it mobility services, uh -huh. and, and not quite transport transportation, but I call it mobility services because some of the telecommunication pricing, uh, congestion pricing for telecom networks, it turned out around 2006, I became aware of similar congestion control pricing uh, issues in transportation, new transportation systems. That so was, that's yeah. really yeah, the, uh, the background. That was a very good shift. It's kind yeah. of shifting from the traffic of electrons yeah. to the traffic of people, people and goods. goods. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that was sort of the connection. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, from there that I started, we looked at, and this was lots of great collaborators and, but early in the career, maybe it was 10, 12 years ago now, mm -hmm. We really started to look at uh, the first one, bike sharing systems, mm -hmm. and I was coming at it from a stochastic networks or you know congestion control standpoint, mm -hmm. and so that was sort of a first foray into transportation, innovative yes, yes. transportation systems. That's great. And um, and then also around that same time, we saw some very interesting and important applications around smart parking, mm -hmm. and then again this had to do with congestion control. Yes. <laughs> road congestion yes. and uh, pricing, so price mm -hmm. of parking. So we, at that point, started into this like innovative mobility space. Mm -hmm. So it's been there ever since. It's been really fun. That's great. I think you know this is really, uh, as I said earlier, your career is really a very good reflection of a systems approach. Mm -hmm. You can see that you mentioned in your PhD training you were uh, working on kind of uh, yeah. these tele uh, telecommunication so, networks and. Uh, yeah control and also kind of optimization uh, but you can see that you know these tools like these theoretical fundamental tools they can be used to address the emerging problems of different fields yeah. right yeah. yeah so 
So when you decided, of course, when you were at uh, CMU, when you decided to do the shift, of course, I think as researchers, you always wanted to yeah. invest your effort in an area that you feel it's an emergent, sure. it's a promising That's area. Right. So, yeah. so at that time or even nowadays, yeah. what do you view, what do you see yeah. as some of the key challenges? that our society or our cities uh, are facing nowadays? Yeah, I mean, this is, that's, that's the question. There's a lot of challenges, you know. Um, you know, one, I'll go back to the systems thing. Like, yes. You know, one aspect of sort of emerging mobility systems is really there are systems inside of a larger city. Mm -hmm. So how ride sharing or interacts with public transit. How does public transit interact with, um, uh, you know, again, taxis or bike share. Like so, there's, there's lots, and and all these systems have impacts on health of citizens, mm -hmm. uh, environmental impact, uh, impact on employment. Yes. You know, so I think part of what we're looking at now is really the these transportation systems themselves. But really, how does that, how are these modes impacting society, mm -hmm. health, yes. education, pollution? those outcomes not necessarily yeah so that how interacting people yes. so that's kind of sort of people centered systems approaches so mm -hmm. the direction yeah. yeah I think kind of that resonates yeah. very well with, um, like with the focus of the Cornell system and inner program here yeah. you know system and inner has a very deep root in military like after yeah. World War One and World War II uh, there is there was huge development in systems and in air uh, in, for Cornell program, in addition to covering those traditional system application areas, actually we try to also distinguish our program from the traditional ones by focusing on what we call commercial systems and a human-centered, yeah. human-centered system. Right. And, and yeah. speaking of which, I think yeah. in the cities and urban areas where yeah. congestion, air pollution, yeah. that's I think the work you are doing, I think that's right. a very, very good match. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and these things interact with the electric city grid. When mm -hmm. you talk about electric vehicles, you, now you're starting to get into the electric grid. Uh, that, that expands the boundaries of the system, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when you, now you're talking about energy systems, and so much, once you're talking about energy systems, then there's a whole other host of issues to deal with. You know, renewables, non-renewables, how, how are you charging your electric vehicle? Or the, what's the source of that? And so, yes. and how does that interact with ride-sharing algorithms? Like, there's a... Yes. Uh, there's a whole world there <laughs> yeah. of systems. So, yeah. It's apparently like you've been working on you know, these so many different topics, but surrounding you know, this kind of smart mobility, and you even mentioned you know, the uh, alternative energy sources uh, after transportation is uh, yeah. electrified. Of course, now coming back to your key area of yeah. like, you know, smart mobility or shared yeah. mobility, yeah. so you mentioned that about yeah. 12 years ago you started looking into this kind of like a bike sharing. That's yeah. I think that, that that time it was probably kind of it was really in a frontier. Like not not many people <laughs> not many uh, were people. looking at that. Yeah. So and now after so many years you've yeah. been working this area and also there are now yeah. so many different developments in yeah. this kind of shared economy. Yeah. So what's your what's your overall view about the future of this shared shared mobility? What is yeah. You know what are the exciting aspects and what are the what what could be the key barriers? What's your overall overall view about this shared mobility? Yeah. My sense, I think the the research says over the years that that it's emerging and about what are the impacts, say particularly of ride ride sharing or ride yes. sourcing. Yes. And you know, works coming out to, to show. I mean that, you know, does this impact? Conge in increase congestion or is it decreasing congestion? Uh -huh. So I think the the uh, jury's still out about the real impacts of these new services on cities, particularly mm -hmm. congestion. Um, some of our work down in Austin showed that, you know, in, in some ways it decreases um, uh, total congestion. Mm -hmm. um, there's other accounts, in, and it's maybe city by city. In New York City, some of these services like ride sourcing may increase congestion. So. Uh, I think that's still an open question that um, everyone's trying to pin down still. Mm -hmm. um, and more congestion is not necessarily bad. I mean, it, if there's more trips, for example, that, that could be more economic activity. Mm -hmm. That could be more uh, connections to people, to employment. So um, on this face, that's not necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. But I think there's still research to be done about whether the, the systems impacts of these rights sourcing mm -hmm. or shared mobility systems. 
I not see. just ride sourcing, but you know, on demand shuttles. Uh, mm-hmm. How does that interact with public transit? Mm-hmm. You know, in the, in the long run, is that going to put public transit out of business? Mm-hmm. And so, when you put public transit out of business, you're talking about then taking away a service that is, is critical and valuable for uh, people with low incomes, for example, mm-hmm. or people with disabilities. So, um, I think there's still open questions there uh-huh. um, about the impact of these services. I see. Yeah, I mean that's at least one area of open okay. open discussion that. Um, and how should uh, cities and citizens respond if uh, if these things are deemed as um, a net negative from public transit, for example? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a still po- policy relevant, societally relevant questions in this space. Shared mobility. Yeah. So so in that case, I think actually this is definitely um, yeah, a very uh, complicated but also interesting area. It yeah. sounds like you are indicating that a shared mobility mm. uh, could be a threat uh, to the public transit yeah let me just make, system so when I say it's, so shared mobility let me back up so right so you you know better yeah. that you know I, I make a distinction between say like ride sourcing uh-huh. ride sharing carpool ride okay. pooling yeah so when we're saying ride sharing sometimes or ride sourcing that's one driver picking up one person uh-huh now ride sharing or ride pooling we may be talking about one driver picking up uh, simultaneously having two passengers in the car uh-huh certainly the congestion impacts of that arrangement are different when mm-hmm. you have multiple passengers in the car yes you may yeah. be getting a net decrease in in uh um, the bmt bmt and so mm-hmm. forth so um so I would make that distinction um, between ride sharing, ride pulling, <laughs> all I these. Ca- you know, there's so many of these new services. How do you categorize them? Yes. Um, and so the same thing with scooters. You know, we have, uh-huh. some, we have some new work about scooters um, and dockless bike share as well. So I see. Uh, there's <laughs> there's enough there's enough new services to go around. I yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. What do you kind of, think? Yeah. I think to get back to kind of early on when we talk about like um, you know the the congestion itself as well as ex- other externality including yeah. air pollution and the public health impact yeah. of this car centric yeah. transportation system that uh, you know the nation uh, has built um, to, to solve these problems um, it seems like um, but in the meantime if you look at European European cities or other kind of more densely populated cities where even New York City like you know you have a relatively better transit system uh, so in now if you think about the challenge of this transit system people are talking a lot about the first mile and the last mile of these problems so as a result some other people think about this you know uh, shared use uh, bike sharing or ride sharing uh, to help the first and the last mile yeah. to help with the transit but I think overall since you're also like you know involved this kind of human factor yeah. research yeah. yeah what are let's assume that if we can assume that this kind of ride sharing overall is a good thing in reducing congestion and in reducing emissions uh, but what are the what are the key barriers for people to adopt this kind of uh, ride sharing like i think ride sharing like in, in ithaca we have this ithaca car share and you've been studying bike sharing yeah, or something right. for more than 10 years. Yeah. So what did you find out as a key difficulty? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because because it's like this culture, this technology, or this kind of mode of traffic, yeah. it's not new. Right. But why yeah. not many people are using that? In some places, like, say, Ithaca, there's the weather, you know. I mean, yes. part of, I mean, part of the year is not really that practical to use them, mm-hmm. you know. And so that's definitely a barrier in a lot of yes. cities that you can't you know, rely on it. Are you going to get rid of your personal vehicle to ride a bike? Uh-huh. Maybe not because, you know, during the cold months, you can't ride your bike. So That's right. The weather is yeah, definitely weather. one element. Well, yeah. Weather is a real element. Um, yeah. You know, another element has to do with placement of the stations. Uh, honestly, uh, Chicago's done a great job and other maybe a couple others. But in general, the stations aren't set up in places where people actually need uh, extra uh, mobility, uh-huh. right? So areas that have low ownership, vehicle ownership, aren't the areas that have uh, bike sharing stations, mm-hmm. for example. And so that's 
that could be a density, a population density issue, or it could be some more fundamental issue about uh, uh, stakeholder engagement, mm-hmm. about yes. where these stations are placed. That's um, true. So yeah. honestly, and the same thing with car sharing, uh, Zipcar. They, you know, and they, you know, Zipcar and others have, have worked on this for years. But I, one could, uh, there's work out there that shows that those stations aren't really uh, in neighborhoods that need mobility the most, mm-hmm. and so that's a challenge um, that that we still face. In, and station-based mobility, you know. That's right. And the same thing for scooters and electric uh, dockless bike share. You say, mm-hmm. okay, our dockless bike share is available where people actually, certainly they need it where, they, where the bikes are now, but do they extend to areas where the marginal value for an additional mode is the highest? I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a question. <laughs> I mean, that's still an open question. I don't have an answer. <laughs> not, um, yeah, I think those are very good uh, observations for, you know, for those difficulties. So as a researcher, uh, you know, yeah. you've been doing this smart mobility yeah. and the kind of uh, shared mobility. So, yeah. so are you, would you, would you ca- categorize yourself mm-hmm. as an advocate of shared mobility or how, how? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, I'm a, so I'm a, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, you know, sometimes like your, your parents, you know, they love you, but they may be one of your you know, harshest critics sometimes. You know? mm-hmm. Yes. And that's love, you know. And, tough and love. Tough uh-huh. love. So that that's my perspective these days on this space. Mm-hmm. That I think these are incredibly exciting and innovative things. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do need to be cognizant of their impact and some of the um, unintended consequences. Mm-hmm. I don't like to use that word because unintended consequences. I mean, some of the impacts indirect impacts of these services and how uh-huh. it impacts the system. So That's we go right. back to the system, like, yes. does the rise of these services mean the decline of uh, public transit or paratransit and so forth? And maybe that's fine. Some things need to, li- <laughs> you know, sometimes things, services need to go away, but it, are the new ones that are taking their place is really um, uh, satisfying the mandate that we have as a society for, for mm-hmm. transportation? I see. So, of course, I think, you know, these things are, you know, there is emergent technologies as well as emergent kind of human behavior. So uh, yeah. now if we can dig a little bit yeah. deeper in your in your research. Yeah. So what are what do you see, you know, to to yeah. to deploy this kind of smart mobility or shared mobility? Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, researchers are trying yeah. to design methods, algorithms to make the system more efficient such that it will be more convenient uh, to the users. Yeah. So what, what do you see as mm-hmm. a research frontier uh, in studying oh, yeah. so shared mobility, yeah. Yeah, yeah. bike sharing or car okay. sharing? Yeah. What are the... Yeah, we yeah. have some new... Uh, I can talk about, we have some work. I have a P, uh, one of my PhD students is looking at really the integration of uh, a bike sharing mm-hmm. uh, Dockless, let's say dockless bike sharing scooters mm-hmm. as a first mile, <laughs> okay. yes. first and last mile connectors to uh, public transit or micro or even on demand shuttles or carpooling. Mm-hmm. So you can, we w- we were looking at the feasibility of using dockless bikes or scooters uh-huh. uh, where individuals can take those uh, modes to a hub, mm-hmm. and at that hub they can jump into a carpool. To their final destinations, right. and so we're really trying to coordinate. Uh, how do you how do you do that? Um, particularly coordination of information, coordination of uh, payment. That's for sure. Integrated payment mm-hmm. system, uh, but ultimately, how many bikes would you need to have in a given area to support this? How uh-huh. many carpool vehicles do you need at the hubs to have a uh, satisfactory quality of service? Mm-hmm. And so from that we, we built a, 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 a queuing theory. So we like built a nice queuing network uh-huh. representation of the first stage of the queuing network, or the, the the travel by bike or scooter to a hub. At the hub, you form a carpool. Yes. And from the carpool, you may go to another hub. Mm-hmm. And then when you get out of the hub, there's a bike, and you take that to your final destination. So we modeled as a queuing network, and then try to understand what kinds of demand patterns would this kind of system support and what kind of throughput uh-huh. would this, this have? So that would require some behavioral adaptations for people to actually use it. 
That's you right. know, um, so there's assumptions about human behavior. You know, would they be willing to, under what under what circumstances, would you be willing to take a scooter to some hub? I see. You know, maybe you receive some discount for doing that. Mm -hmm. Like how much of a discount would be needed? So we were exploring in the pricing pricing strategies strategy. Really. Certainly, this should be cheaper, yes. perhaps than the, than the original system. So, uh, so we have a paper where we're sort of doing sensitivity analysis on on all those factors. Mm -hmm. and so those uh, that works out now. So that I think the unifying. I think now what what I see is the the next wave of this is really the integration mm -hmm. of these modes under a given platform. So I see. Yeah. yeah, and you see, I can talk. I can talk forever. Oh yes, stuff. please. Because I, I mean, because I think you see now the emergence of acquisitions of of, of folks consolidating under uh, a friend of mine, Dave Zipper, says the walled gardens. So you have the Lyft ecosystem. You have ecosystems. So you have the Lyft ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Lyft now own, bought Motivate, which is a bike sharing company, mm -hmm. um, and maybe they're aligned with a scooter company. So, so it could be one day under Lyft you can get access to some bike and some scooter and a ride share. But Uber has their own ecosystem. They have a partnership with uh, Jump Bikes. Mm -hmm. They bought Jump Bikes. Then they also maybe have a partnership with Bird Scooters. So you have an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So you have these two different ecosystems that are not talking to each other. Uh -huh. And I think that uh, probably leads to overcapacity. Too many of these scooters on the streets. You don't need that many. Maybe you have twice as many as you need. <laughs> That's right. Uh, maybe you have twice as many Uber and Lyfts on the street as you need because they don't. These systems don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And so this is, um, I think, an interesting issue. Of how the these ecosystems will emerge, or how do you model? Are there some ways to integrate these, or should they be separate? Mm -hmm. So I think that's an area that uh, is exciting. Yeah, that, that is really a very exciting research problem. Yeah. You can see that it's really, first of all, you know, within each ecosystem, there is a vertical yes, a, kind of relationship, that's right. right? And then in parallel, you have these multiple ecosystems, like you have a Lyft ecosystem, you have Uber, of course, and you have the traditional mass transit. That's right. Uh, right. system yeah. so you know when you were talking about that I was wondering for example yeah. if I'm using a uber uh, shared bike mm. or scooter mm. can I actually uh, bike to a mass transit station instead of yeah. to a uber <laughs> car sharing station I'm not fully familiar with it <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd imagine yes you know, uh -huh. yeah I would hope so yeah yes yeah I hope so um, my sense is that these ecosystems are going to be even accelerated in a world of autonomous. That's true. That maybe there's some partnerships mm -hmm. that emerge around e autonomous. So maybe there's an ecosystem, there's autonomous vehicles, rideshare, scooters, bikes, and who knows what other services emerge, but they could still be separate mm -hmm. ecosystems. Yeah. And so when you have autonomous vehicles, maybe... Instead of two of these ecosystems, there could be, I don't know how many, three, mm -hmm. four. And then I wonder how those interact. You know, and yeah. So, that's. So, so for that, yes, it, it is really you know, kind of a complicated issue. And also mm -hmm. a lot of patterns or mm -hmm. like, you know, the consequences are yet yeah. to be observed that's right. with, with all this market yeah. now emerging. Yeah. So, but you know, uh, from your from your from the research mm -hmm. you've done, like yeah. if you were uh, to share some of your insights yeah. about yeah. the future of mobility, what do you, what, <laughs> what kind of picture would you paint for our transportation, say, ten years into the future oh, wow. and fifty years <laughs> in the future? What, what would you possibly you really imagine? Ask the, the tough questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, if I do, I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd be sitting here. I would go make a lot of money. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess you can look back historically, maybe. That's a very good way. You know, to maybe yes. that's a way to think about um, mm -hmm. these networked systems, you know, competition among network systems. Mm -hmm. So I think the telephone started out this way, a network system, but there were, I think, well, 
telephone system started as a pure monopolist. Mm-hmm. And then there was some time of some competition. But the monopolist was so, AT&T was so entrenched that it was tough to compete. Mm -hmm. But then you also had railroads, for example. You have competition in railroads. That's another network kind of system. And and there, you saw lots of competition. Uh, But eventually, uh, you got a lot of collusion Mm -hmm. that happened. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. uh, uh, Internet. So, Facebook. MySpace. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe I, I would just maybe think that competition in network um, platforms mm-hmm. historically that might be a place to think about what could happen. Um, so I don't have any answer, but I can say maybe historical analysis could help in some ways to think about some of the possibilities. Yeah, I really like the way like you you, you brought up like looking at this issue from a historic point of view. It's it's really yeah because for very co- complicated issues, you know, probably the the best way to learn. Is to look back into uh, look back into the history, and we, even all this either regulation or deregulation yeah. or you know kind of the competition in the market. Yeah. So I think one key, one key thing is really how the consumers or the market yeah. uh, will respond. So in that sense, yeah. you know, at at Amtri, like in addition oh, yeah. to the work you are oh, doing, yeah. I believe you know it's it's yeah. a huge yeah. uh, institute. So. Uh, yeah. uh, would you like to share like a yeah. other what are the major yeah, you know, research areas that yeah. that you feel excited? Yeah, I mean at Umtree, I mean it's an institute at University of Michigan that's been around, as you know, for over fifty years now, mm-hmm. and it was really founded in regards to um, what could be seen as a failure of industry related to car safety. Mm-hmm. So it was around the times of a lot of car accidents and no seatbelt laws or the vehicles weren't created uh, in a way that were protecting the occupants, protect, you know. Mm-hmm. And so part of, still a fundamental mission of Umtree is around safety. So there's a lot of safety research that happens there. I see. Um, be it active, they call it active safety or passive safety. Mm-hmm. Um, passive safety are things like occupant protection and crash test, you know, crash test dummies and uh-huh. um, a lot of biomechanics and so forth. That goes on there. But also active safety. So these are things like um, adaptive cruise control, anti-lock brakes. Some of those systems were first, you know, cause tested at at Umtree. And so, along the dimension of active safety, there's a Umtree runs the largest um, pilot of something called uh, vehicle-to-vehicle communication. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a system. It's not kind of like Wi-Fi for your car. You know? mm-hmm. So you basically your car. Uh, sends out messages that says, here I am, here's the direction I'm moving, here's how fast I'm moving. Uh-huh. It just generates messages 10 times per second. Mm-hmm. And then other vehicles that are equipped with this technology can also can receive these messages. Mm-hmm. And the idea that this is a safety-enhancing system. And so that's some of the fundamental work that is happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, one way that, that sort of this connect, connects to the new mobility systems and so autonomous vehicles and so mm-hmm. forth is that Certainly, there there could be some benefit of having these connected vehicle technology together with uh, ride sharing for safety, for example, or um, certainly for autonomous vehicles for navigation. Mm-hmm. When these cars can talk to the infrastructure, so there's V to I, you know, the communication. So that at Umtree, that's really the the focus is safety, um, but also now mobility as well, but sort of grounded in safety. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do these are these shared mobility systems safer um, than previous? Right. Mm-hmm. So, does ride sharing increase or decrease the amount of crashes that happen? Mm-hmm. Is a question that I think is still open question. It is. I think is. that's still yeah. an open question, and and so that's the interaction between safety and some of these new modes. Yeah. Scooters, you know, <laughs> are people falling off of these scooters and and uh, having brain injuries? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's the interaction with safety. Yeah, I think safety is definitely a very you know a, a big concern, and also I, I feel uh, so what so and then you know Amtree is having a very strong focus on safety, and then, then mm-hmm. like, how about Midas like a uh, Michigan oh, yeah. Institute for Data Science? What yeah. what is what is the perspective focus area? Yeah, so my the the Data Science Institute at Michigan I think it's been around three or four years. So it's a cross cutting uh, institute across mm-hmm. the university to catalyze 
you know, research and data science. Okay. So there's people in the medical school, uh, people who are involved in learning, mm -hmm. you know, education, uh, people in transportation, mm -hmm. um, uh, social sciences. So there's a lot of different sub branches of, of Midas, but it's an institute that catalyzes across campus and tries to cross fertilize uh, interdisciplinary research mm -hmm. in data science. So that's that's what the mission is there. Um, and so it's been great to be part of. They've supported me and my work and, uh -huh. and students, and so it's been great. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, so now coming back to this kind of smart mobility, um, I think we're we're, we're getting to uh, an end. I want to kind of uh, seek your mm -hmm. insight about. Yeah. I believe in the, the the whole society as well as researchers. We are really excited about uh, the future smart mobility, but now from where we are now the status quo of our transportation to some kind of intermediate goal of smart mobility which you've been working yeah. on. Yeah. So what are like some say, you know, top few yeah. um, issues or strategies that you would recommend uh, for us to get there? <laughs> yeah, so from good. today's transportation yeah. to future smart mobility systems. And we're here at Cornell in New York, so I think about the issues in New York City. Yes. With public transportation and the mm -hmm. bus and the subways and the state of I don't want to say disrepair but you know ha they've had some issues with reliability mm -hmm. and I think having a strong public network is important mm -hmm. an investment in a strong public uh, be it transit be it subway it can be a, a newer version of that you know micro transit or something mm -hmm. but I think that's a core enabler of the rest of the economy in society I see and preserving not in not like not in some way that holds it back but keeping a mission for a public option for mobility mm -hmm. that serves the public I think is important and so investment in, in that I would say is a um, a way a, a, a way <laughs> a uh -huh. step forward yes um, I think you hit a very important yeah. point you can see I think like when you, when I ask your question, when you probably your first response actually, apparently you did you did not point to oh we need to develop more technology. Instead, I think you point to a very key issue, yeah. kind of public network, yeah. and I think that's exactly yeah. probably the key issue is. Yeah. It's yeah. not about technology. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I say the public part just has to do with the people, or yes, the meeting the, people, the needs yes, human, of, yes. and and certainly shared mobility uh, serves the needs very well for. Or quite some fraction of society, you can tell by the how much evaluations and how much venture capitalists put money into this area that, and people use these things, right? Mm -hmm. Sharing it, people use them; they're valuable. Uh, but I think there's a mandate for cities and government to to make sure that um, it's accessible to a, a broader set of people, and I think that's. A challenge and an opportunity. It's a big opportunity for shared mobility companies. There's that's a lot true. of demand that's not being potentially not being served, and I think that's a business opportunity. But it's also uh, um, a mandate that I think society probably wants too. So mm -hmm. I think it aligns. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it, it, yes, I think it does so, align. I think it it, aligns, yeah, it yeah. does align up, you know, very well. Point, yeah. So you can see that all we are trying to develop research algorithm methodology and even technology to enable. Yeah this smart mobility so that yeah. it can reduce the overall cost yeah. of our transportation, yeah. right? But one thing kind of probably, uh, I myself, I don't have the answer either, but I kind of I want to see how you see this. You know, from a, from an economics point of view, if you think of transportation or mobility as, you know, as a, cons as a consumption good, mm. so which means now if you reduce the cost, mm of a good yeah. and then suppose that market demand sure goes up. will go up so there is induced demand yeah so that when there is induced demand that it will increase the vehicle miles traveled right so right. yeah but i think you made a very good point earlier mm -hmm. kind of say actually sometimes actually congestion is a good thing because congestion kind of if i reflect it's a reflection of economic uh, development, but then that will lead us to what extent of congestion is good and what <laughs> what what extent of congestion is yeah. is bad. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I don't know. That that's, that's a tough call, right? 
I don't know if you. Yeah, would you want to be in a city that has no congestion? Maybe that city's not so economically viable, and maybe you don't have a job in that city. I don't uh -huh. know. Um, but certainly, you don't want to be in gridlock. So maybe mm -hmm. there is some <laughs> uh -huh. uh, level in between. That's the right level. That's I don't know. You, yes, you ask a very good question. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think there's lots of challenges and opportunities yes. still in this space, and I think who knows how it will develop. Uh, yeah. So I think so now uh, we're going to wrap this up, but I, I think before we end, I would like to, as I mentioned earlier, you know, your, you know, your work, your career path is really a very good reflection mm -hmm. of how you know, systems approach mm -hmm. is, is, is formulated yeah. towards yeah. oil research questions. Uh, you know, now Cornell System Engineering Program, we also have a PhD program in systems. Oh, okay, yeah. So we started yeah. this PhD program in systems two years ago. So now it's, we, have, we, we are running both a PhD program as well as a master level uh, kind of professional degree program. So for all these yeah. students in our systems program, both PhD student and master student, and uh, what would you tell these students? How should they prepare them? You know, kind of knowledge-wise, oh, or so these things. Because you know, you've been successful yeah. doing this system research, yeah. and okay. like, what tips or oh. what uh, lessons would you tell these people so that they can have mm -hmm. you know a good career you know ahead of them? Yeah, I, you know, I I've, I've been I was fortunate enough that I, I think a good foundation. Mm -hmm. And for me, whatever that foundation is, but for me, I had access to, uh, during my PhD, a, a, a great uh, foundation in stochastic processes, mm -hmm. uh, control theory, queuing theory. That's my background. And I think that that served me well, um, a rigorous sort of grounding in that has served me well uh, throughout the years. Mm -hmm. uh, there's are certainly other groundings to have, you know, in systems be that you know more a complex system maybe like ecology you know ecological approaches could be interesting nowadays with systems um, mm -hmm. certainly control theory feedback uh, systems differential equations PDEs you know mm -hmm. I think a, a nice rigorous fa training is you know then you can build on that and, and add you know extend the knowledge in those spaces as it relates to the systems you care about yes um, there's also, you know, sociological network type of foundations. Yes. You know, if you want to build strength in, you know, network theory, mm -hmm. contagion, the way uh, rumors or way information flows in networks, I think that's also uh, these days an incredibly strong foundation to have that seems to have some uh, resonance going forward. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think there's lots of different fundamental kind of groundings yes that one can have uh -huh. and I would say whatever one you want get that and, and really master the the fundamentals and, and and then you can go from there I think that's so, that's, that's that's actually I think very good yeah. advice because I think uh, you know for system people because you know systems yes systems approach is good because it takes a holistic approach like saying, however uh, for researchers or for students it could easily make them yeah lose the focus yeah. but I think you point exactly. yeah, you know, kind of for a student to really establish a very solid yeah. foundation sure. in a certain area right yeah that's very good that's what I would say <laughs> wonderful <laughs> okay, wonderful <thanks. laughs> thank you very much Rob yes <laughs>